It's my great pleasure to introduce tonight um, Joseph Grima. Joseph is uh, the editor-in-chief of Domus Magazine, uh, one of the top architecture publications. Um, and really, actually, since he started just a few months ago, uh, the magazine has really positioned, has really become um, one of the um, most, uh, <clears throat> I would say, the most attentive publications to uh, new trends in architecture and uh, in fab digital fabrication in open source architecture. And so he's, I think he's been doing a great job as, uh, as editor. He is also the curator of the Istanbul Biennale that will open in, in the fall, this fall. And he's done many, many other things. Uh, but I, uh, beyond all of that, he's, uh, he's also a great friend. So I'll uh, please join me to uh, welcome Joseph. Thank you very much, Carlo. Um, uh, it's actually quite surreal to be presenting in this building because I had been um, involved in a quite minor way in the same, uh, in one of the programs in the New York uh, BMW Guggenheim Lab. And uh, in, of course, it was inside the same building, which in the meantime has migrated across the ocean and uh, landed here in Berlin. So it's a, a strange condition to actually be chasing this building around the world. Uh, and I hear that it's going to uh, Mumbai next. Um, but I think in, in a way that um, is quite appropriate in a way to be uh, presenting in such an unconventional architectural space, uh, because the the ideas that we're talking about here are really um, the product of a dramatically changed uh, condition and context for architecture in which this is a very kind of physical, um, tangible manifestation of the potential of architecture as a transformative entity today. Uh, but what um, I wanted to talk about a little bit, uh, a little bit today is actually um, something uh, quite different and uh, look at mu much more the kind of the, the behind the scenes, the ideas that are shaping the uh, evolution of certain architectural practices today, completely new ways of thinking about architecture and more broadly about design. Uh, so the, um, the reason I'm here this evening is actually, um, it begins probably about um, a year ago. It's uh, just over a year ago now in, um, when uh, last June we decided to, the June of 2011, we decided to dedicate the issue of Domus to open source design and to use it as a way of really exploring something that we didn't understand and trying to, in a way, map a condition that we felt was really defining uh, some of the most progressive and innovative thinking in design in a broad way, but without really knowing what it was. This is the issue that uh, we produced, um, was um, uh, issue 948 of uh, June 2011. Uh, and, of course, Carlo, we all um, within the field and even outside the field have been following, many have been following his work in terms of thinking about not simply the potential of new technologies, but of new collaborative methods uh, of practice, uh, new ways of um, new economic models uh, that define the design today. And so in that context, I really wanted to um, involve Carlo some way as a, a, a sort of a... a to give an overview, a perspective on the um, emerging field of open source design and open source architecture. And so I proposed to him, why don't you write an editorial about this? And Carlo replied by saying, uh, actually for me to write an editorial on my own would be um, quite inappropriate for a topic like open source architecture. It would be much more interesting uh, to actually, in a way, do a crowdsourcing operation uh, and to collaboratively write this editorial. Uh, and so uh, he proposed, what he said, why don't we actually make a new page on Wikipedia called Open Source Architecture, which at the time uh, there was no such entry on Wikipedia. And why don't we invite a bunch of people, um, 10, 12 uh, people from uh, Nicholas Negroponte to Hans Ulrich Obrist, from every possible field, from art to design to architecture, um, to Paolo Antonelli, um, Chiara Somaini, many of our friends, colleagues, acquaintances, people who we've collaborated with over the last years, and together write a, an editorial that is also a sort of a manifesto for something that none of us know what it is, but that somehow could converge, these different viewpoints could come together. And of course the beautiful thing about the Wikipedia page is that it's never finished, and so it's a, it's a real 21st century manifesto in the sense that it's in permanent evolution, and I must say, this evening when I opened it to um, put it up on the screen here, uh, I found that it had completely changed 
not necessarily for the better since <laughs> since last time um, I was particularly interested in this sentence uh, cooking is <laughs> is often held as an open, early uh, early form of open source vernacular architecture I think that we could dedicate a whole two hours to discussing that <laughs> that topic alone uh, but anyway so we put this we put this page up and we all started to put our ideas in and to edit it and backwards and forwards and so on and then something very funny happened because uh, Wikipedia has very strict rules about what can and what can't be published as a page, what is valid and what isn't. And one of the ironies is that actually to have a, w a page on Wikipedia on a given topic, you have to substantiate the validity of that topic by referencing print articles. So it's this strange sort of circular uh, logic of digital referencing print. And of course, because nothing had been published on the time and the idea of open source architecture, the page was deleted, or it was listed for deletion, and it, in fact it was deleted. And we undeleted it again and continued editing, and it was deleted, and then we undeleted. And then of course in the end, uh, uh, the print deadline came, and we did a copy-paste, and we put it into the magazine, we published the magazine, and then of course there was published material about open source architecture, so, uh, <laughs> so now the page can legitimately stand here on Wikipedia and here it is uh, to stay. But of course the great thing is that it's in this status of permanent evolution, uh, it gets um, cluttered up with errors and mistakes and absurdities, it, uh, brilliant ideas come in and then get reshaped, and in a way this is uh, it, 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 it's absolutely um, what we were interested in and uh, in thinking about what the potential of this is in the field of design. What does it mean to do something like this in design? How can the ideas of multiple people and especially end users come together into a built um, uh, architectural artifact? Uh, and so I wanted to take a step back and to talk a little bit about um, to leave in a way a question mark hanging over this idea of open source architecture this evening uh, and rather than coming here to give you a kind of a prepackaged um, neat formulaic response to what is open source architecture to actually put this question in the spirit of this wikipedia manifesto and to open it up to you and maybe afterwards um, have um, with Carlo open up the discussion make transform this more into a sort of a, a collective brainstorming because uh, this is something that really, even now, we have not arrived at an answer to, but in a very intuitive sense, which I think is um, one of the really interesting things about designing today, is that it's very much a product of, um, design is often the product of intuition and a much more, uh, much less rational, and much more intuitive uh, approach. Uh, and in that sense, I wanted to take a step back a second and just look at a few things. These are ideas that have mostly been um, the product of some research that we've been doing with the curatorial team of the Istanbul Design Biennale, which is going to be opening, as Carla mentioned, in October. Uh, and one of the key um, episodes that we are interested in kind of looking at as a key reference point in the last um, year or two is uh, the Microsoft Kinect. Probably some of you know this. It's a, very, it's a, it's a device that sits on top of your um, Microsoft uh, Xbox 360 gaming console. Uh, and it allows you to interact with the game without actually using any form of control. It actually maps your body in 3D in real time. Uh, and this, of course, was hailed the instant it was put on the market. It sold twice the speed of the iPad, iPod. Uh, and it was instantly hailed as a major revolution in man-machine interaction, uh, precisely because it was so intuitive. It was something that was uh, really uh, kind of unprecedented in terms of its um, ability to uh, create a, a form of direct physical interaction with a machine, with an with a, a artificial environment. Uh, but what was also really interesting is that less than 24 hours after it had been uh, put on sale, it was instantly taken apart. Uh, and it was stripped down by sites such as iFixit, where this photo comes from, uh, and it was actually kind of disassembled to understand how this kind of magic was happening, how somebody could actually play a football game on a screen without actually holding any kind of controller and the computer being able to see you and map your movements. Uh, and of course, the easy part was stripping down the hardware, and the much more complicated part was stripping down software and actually understanding, cracking the code that was controlling this machine. And the interest in that, of course, was to be able to adapt it to uh, all sorts of uses. I mean, you can imagine how many things you could do with a, uh, with a, with a device that can actually map your, um, uh, your body movement. And 
a, 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 a non-profit in New York put a $1,000 prize on the first um, for the uh, up for the first uh, researcher or hacker who could uh, crack this code and, and publish it online at a, uh, as an open source code. And the interesting thing is that Microsoft instantly called up its lawyers and uh, sent the lawyers after this um, foundation and threatened to sue the hell out of them if they, had, uh, if they did actually publish online the code behind the um, Xbox 360. Uh, and that kind of went on for a while and then a couple of weeks later it was published online. And from then a whole series of blogs sprung up uh, that were documenting the progress of actually mapping, the, making the Kinect uh, do all sorts of incredible things from self-driving vehicles to um, systems that would allow the blind to uh, navigate the city without crashing into objects and so on. It became this kind of uh, platform for all sorts of uh, really kind of incredible and unprecedented in innovations. And it took Microsoft a full six months to realize that actually it had taken completely the wrong uh, path. Instead of trying to pursue all of these uh, hackers and um, makers and people who are trying to adapt this platform, it, would, it should actually uh, be taking advantage of this. So they actually decided to publish themselves the code online, open source it, and from then the sales actually uh, increased by 50%. Uh, uh, and it became this kind of broad, incredible um, uh, collaborative effort across the world to find innovative ways of using this hardware. And this is uh, something that in uh, design is a, a really kind of an epochal change uh, in the sense that we have become accustomed throughout the 20th century to an idea of design as something that is top down, that is closed systems, uh, that is something that is impenetrable and that occurs inside a factory somewhere, a research lab. And that, in a space of an incredibly sp short space of time, in a space of one year or two years, three years, has been replaced. By, for a whole generation of designers by a completely different attitude which Paolo Antonelli uh, summed up in the Domus column with the name of thinkering, uh, which is uh, exactly the opposite approach. It's the idea of actually designing by breaking things, by taking them apart, by putting them back together in a different form. Uh, and it's, uh, she cited in this, um, uh, in her piece, uh, in the past reaching for consumer uh, reaching the consumer with a finished product meant reaching the terminus of the design process. But that was a time when we, designers, used to design for them, the consumers. Those rancid old times have gone. So basically what, uh, what Ilse Crawford was uh, hinting at here is the idea that the, the idea of the designer is somebody who packages a completed product, something that, is, that can't be taken apart, that simply has to be used as it is. If you're lucky it can be repaired, otherwise maybe it should be thrown out as soon as it's obsolete. These days are over and have been replaced by a completely different idea in which uh, actually imperfection itself is a value uh, in which the end user is actually someone who uh, is actually going to be engaged in the production of the product perhaps. So the, may, in a way the designer is someone who is not actually going to package a finished object but is actually going to possibly um, package a set of parts or perhaps a platform, something that can be interpreted. This is a the workshop chair by Jersey Seymour, who I believe actually lives here in um, uh, Berlin, uh, a seminal project from a few years back in which um, an incredibly strong bond, bonding uh, material holds together a chair which is simply kind of stuck together by the um, user uh, who heats up the um, material itself. And this, um, this actually has, uh, when, you, when you start to look into it, um, you, you suddenly realize how some of the kind of incredibly utopian visions of the 60s and 70s, such as Enzo Mari's Auto Progettazione, have, strangely enough, a period of 30, 40 years later, actually become some of um, the have become principles that have de facto been absorbed into the design process, something that have uh, almost become, so to speak, mainstream. And it, this is a demonstration of how certain uh, designers of the uh, 60s and 70s had incredibly visionary ideas that perhaps were um, ahead of their times and that have actually come to, uh, come to um, fruition in a completely in unexpected um, route. Uh, this is the, these are the outer projectation uh, tables and chair furniture by, designed by Enzo Mari in 1974. Uh, this was an incredibly um, 
incredibly controversial gesture on Enzo Mari's part. Enzo Mari, of course, uh, you know, is one of the great Italian masters of 20th century industrial design. And his, uh, uh, his, um, one of his most significant acts of politicization of design was to actually say, as a designer, I'm not going to give to you as end user a product that has been produced in a factory somewhere, but I'm actually going to give you a set of instructions which allow you to put this, um, to assemble a table yourself, which is made out of extremely poor materials. Uh, it's not a coincidence, it, it's a, actually, um, in a way, a kind of a precursor uh, of both of DIY and of um, IKEA in many ways, uh, but that, in, that actually embody all of the virtues of good design uh, through, I, I had the opportunity to actually make some of these tables recently for an exhibition we did in Milan. And it's actually really incredible when you put them together how well designed they are, how they fit together, uh, they disassemble in an incredibly um, clever, logical way, the extremely economical use of materials, extremely stable, total cost of maybe 120, 130 euros. And I have a, uh, one of these in my apartment and it's strangely enough, it's a I get much more, many more comments from this than from the Saarinen table in the uh, room next door. Uh, and this is the um, this is the chair, the um, the uh, outer projection chair. And the, uh, John Habraken, of course, is another example of this, um, in which um, this is a very well-known project, the World Bottle, in which he uh, uh, had the idea of, uh, on commission of Heineken, uh, making a, a bottle, a container for liquid, into something that could also be a building block and that could therefore uh, serve a dual purpose and that could actually um, kind of come together to become an architectural element in a way. And so, of course, this is kind of some of the precursors of the idea of sustainability and recycling and so on. And so what I'm kind of also hinting at is that I think we've, we've already talked about open source architecture, about the idea of hacking, about DIY, about self, um, about intervention, um, end user, uh, sustainability and so on. And these are all terms that really resonate with the current um, uh, the current philosophy of many designers, many themes that have actually broken out of the realm of design have made it into the consciousness of uh, a general public. And I think that's one of the really interesting things is the kind of the breadth, the kind of intangibility of this topic that touches so many different aspects of uh, life and so many different currents of design uh, and that ties them all together. So one of the challenges that we're um, trying to, uh, how can I say, um, uh, get a handle on in Istanbul is actually in this uh, exhibition that we're putting together is how to talk about a condition, uh, uh, how to talk about all of these things less as kind of different fields of design with different disciplines and sustainability and open source and so on and actually to look at design as a key viewpoint into a cultural condition that permeates everyday life. Uh, I think that um, this is another project by Martino Gamper, 100 Chairs in 100 Days, which is the idea of kind of hacking chairs. Um, and uh, a project by, um, actually I'm, uh, his name escapes me, a former student of the Royal College of Art in London, uh, just again to add another kind of layer of um, the idea of design as a form of research into the um, as a way, as a medium for understanding much more closer to artistic practice in a way, as a medium of understanding the complexity of the objects that we live with on a daily basis. He took a, an, a, a toaster, an everyday object that we use even without thinking, and decided to actually to try to make one from zero, from scratch, actually making the plastic, making the metal, shaping it, making the plug, socket, and so on. And of course it was a complete failure, which was a testament in a way to the complexity of the industrial process that we really take for granted on a, um, on a daily basis. Uh, so one of the designers that we're working with in um, uh, Istanbul is called Thomas LeMay, who founded a group called Open Structures. Uh, Open Structures, and um, it's interesting, he's from Brussels, from um, Belgium. Uh, and at the moment, Belgium, for whatever reason, I don't really know why, is a kind of a hotbed for thinking um, in terms of um, open source design, uh, especially in the kind of furniture design, industrial design realm, is by far the most interesting place. Uh, there's a community of extremely interesting people uh, grouped around this um, museum called, uh, exhibition space called Z33, which I would really recommend that you visit. And Thomas 
decide his his idea um, as a he was a former student of Eindhoven uh, Design School, and his idea was that in a way. Um, Design today is, uh, as we said, not so much about producing objects. So if it's not about producing objects, what is design? Uh, and his idea was that in a way design should be, the process of uh, designing is in a way the creation of a common language, something that allows designers, I mean, it, it starts from the premise that in a way everybody is a designer today. We're all designers. Uh, and the problem is often that each of us as designers don't have the possibility of bringing um, of, uh, how can I say, interlocking agendas. And so his, his project um, with the Open Structures Group was to create a sort of a, a universal, an Esperanto for objects, so to speak, uh, actually by establishing a grid, a, a module, that would allow different people to produce single elements, to perhaps produce them themselves, um, manufacture them possibly in their own workshops, but to put all of these into a single repository online, uh, that would then allow companies, customers, um, individuals, end users, architects to all contribute to a single system of production which could be adapted to pretty much anything from furniture to vehicles, transportation. Uh, and so this is in a way, I mean it's a very beautiful reference in a way to the um, super studio grid of the 1960s, the infinite monument and the, this idea of a kind of a grid that uh, brings, uh, that unifies uh, but turned on itself because of course um, super studio's grid was a, a sort of a, uh, almost a form of protest against the uh, homogeneity of uh, mass culture that was emerging at the time and Thomas's grid is in a way an attempt to use design as uh, as I said as a form of Esperanto as a form of communication almost uh, and so here you can see some of the objects that he develops I and mean, it's also incredibly beautiful the, as the aesthetic that he's um, developed for presenting these objects each of which is um, uh, built according to the proportions. It's almost like a modular in a way of um, uh, referencing to, um, Corbusier's modular. And through the um, application and the, the reassembly of almost like a sort of meccano of um, extremely simple objects, one can achieve all sorts of configurations for a kitchen, for example. Uh, and this is a, uh, a prototype that he presented in, um, in Milan at the Salona last year and that we published in this um, issue of Open Source, uh, an open source Art, uh, Design Domus, uh, but is also applicable to a coffee machine. But one I mean, all of this to some extent has been done before. But what was most interesting with Thomas's project was that this coffee machine, uh, he, he built into the process of design the idea of versioning, the idea that an object is never finished, it's never complete, a little bit like this uh, open source architecture manifesto on Wikipedia. It's something that's in, com in continual evolution and that can maybe be adapted to continually different uses. So um, this coffee machine, for example, was he, he, he took it to various designers who developed it, worked on it, and then he took it to another one who said, this could actually be very easily adapted to making a water boiler. And so this guy took it apart, added, changed a couple of elements and, and transformed it into a water boiler. So then the kind of the family branched out and it turned into a water boiler that in turn has been uh, evolving itself. So one of the things we're going to be presenting in Istanbul is actually a series of uh, version 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, a little bit like software, but for hardware, which is uh, I think an incredibly interesting idea. Here are some other um, examples of um, uh, chairs. And the interesting thing about this is actually none of it was designed by Thomas himself. Uh, all of it was simply coming together uh, parts that were brought together according to this grid that he set up. And um, a lot of his work is actually in uh, formalizing a theory for all of this and he makes these incredibly beautiful posters that are in a way a sort of manifesto um, and these two are particularly interesting as on the left you have the before mass communication and now peer-to-peer -peer communication and, and this is an incredibly important point because he's not talking so much about production there's so much talk and rhetoric at the moment about how technology has completely transformed the production processes today but what Tom, one of the um, in incredibly interesting intuitions is that what is most, the, what has changed most dramatically is actually the possibilities of communication, and that is actually what is transforming the way that we relate ourselves to objects, the in, the economic processes behind the production of objects. So, on the left you have the sort of the top-down model of the factory that produces, and then disseminates to a 
a, 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 a group of passive consumers who um, uh, is kind of this one directional monologue from the top down. And his, his uh, open structures model proposes a circular uh, system in which the factory is engaged in a dialogue with the designer and the designer is engaged in a dialogue with the end user and there's this multi-directional dialogue which is actually has no hierarchy so to speak this is the ultimate um, aim but of course at the same time the um, technology um, is also an, uh, an important aspect and um, the possibility of actually manufacturing things on the fly, um, 3D printing, uh, uh, the, the whole Fab Lab um, uh, movement uh, that was um, largely originated in MIT. Um, these, this is a project by uh, Minale Maeda, another group from uh, Rotterdam, Eindhoven, uh, who in a sort of a reference to cross-reference both to Rietveld and to Enzo Mari's Auto Projectazione, designed a series of uh, sofas that could be um, that could be uh, down the, the plans of which could be downloaded from the internet and could be self-made. Uh, but then the interesting thing is it's a kind of a combination of self-make and designer because the, um, the the cushions, of course, are something that they produce; they manufacture themselves. Um, and these clips that cover the screws are 3D printed by themselves in their office and then shipped out to anybody who orders the. Um, uh, the mattresses, and this is a um, this is part of a series called Inside Out Furniture, which has this kind of incredibly um, spare Spartan aesthetic, but it's also incredibly beautiful at the same time. So another interesting thing, talking again about the many um, uh, aspects of this, is that there's a move away from the perfection of industrial production of typical of the 20th century towards a much more kind of ad hoc um, aesthetic of um, self-production in a way. And of course Kickstarter has, uh, is another um, uh, incredibly, um, uh, is one of the driving forces behind all of this because um, we were talking before about communication and how it's uh, revolutionized, possibly one of the most um, revolutionary aspects of this um, process of uh, ubiqu ubiquitous uh, ability to communicate and to exchange information is the establishment of um, a finally after many many um, years of uh, uh, promise um, of uh, revolution of an effective uh, crowdfunding platform that allows uh, again destabilizes this model of the down top down production in which a brand develops an idea has to spend millions of dollars in industrializing it with Kickstarter an idea can be put online whoever you are whether you're a big name designer or whether you're an individual uh, you're probably going to be producing it yourself in a small garage backyard somewhere uh, if the idea takes off and um, many have uh, they will uh, you can um, conceivably be uh, have a turnover in equal to a 50-year-old company in a matter of weeks. Uh, and this is something that is completely unprecedented in the history of design. This is a project that was on Kickstarter but is also a, um, an incredibly interesting uh, example of open source design. It's a group called um, uh, Open Source, uh, uh, well, the project's called Open Source Ecology, uh, which is an attempt to create a sort of a database of farming equipment that's made out of the most elementary uh, uh, elements that can be bought pretty much in any hardware store and self-assembled, uh, so which ranges from the um, this um, life track uh, digger that can be adap adapted to all sorts of uses and can be manufactured for 9,000 euros uh, when the equivalent uh, manufactured by a company like John Deere would probably cost in the range of 30 to 35,000 uh, euros. And I think there are incredibly interesting similarities in a way between those chairs, the Minale Maeda chairs, or the Enzo Mari Auto Projectazione and this tractor. It's really like a Auto Projectazione tractor in a way. So this is the full grid of all of the um, uh, open source ecology um, items. And they, of course, funded this through um, through Kickstarter, uh, and this was um, a typical, a relatively typical case in which uh, the the amount uh, funded was actually a lot more than uh, what was initially requested. Uh, another in, uh, a very interesting um, uh, case is the uh, RepRap, which, in a way, in many ways, is the kind of the grandfather of a lot of these projects, um, which was uh, born, I believe, at the University of Bath. 
um, from a, 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 as part of a research studio. Uh, the interesting, I mean, this is a uh, kind of one of the earliest um, low-cost open source 3D printers, something that's become uh, almost ubiquitous now. I mean, uh, maker bots have become uh, completely mainstream. Um, but the interesting thing about this one is that it was, it was completely predicated on the idea of being able to reproduce itself. So it's a machine that can actually print the parts that are necessary to make another machine. What's incredibly beautiful about this idea and about this project is that it's in a way, uh, hardware for the first time kind of encountering the world of peer-to-peer -peer production. So the way that files um, through um, in file sharing are replicated throughout a network, you can actually, you could, the idea was that you could actually apply the same logic of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, dissemination to hardware. Uh, and of course this is really in many ways um, the, uh, and of course that in turn brings up all sorts of other uh, issues if you think about um, this, this is uh, called um, kiosk, uh, which is a mobile unit um, by uh, a group in Bel another Belgian group called Unfold, uh, which is a, a is a tricycle mounted um, maker bot or uh, some kind of 3D printer. I don't know which one. Um, that also in the front here in this little. Um, Underneath that door is a Kinect, the machine I was talking about before, that can actually make a 3D scan of an object, such as Philip Stark's uh, lemon squeezer, and replicate it on the spot. So it's like a, uh, a, a obviously it's a, it's a kind of a, a provocative gesture more than anything else. They're not really going around photocopying objects through the city, but it's a, it was inspired actually, um, and the title is a homage to Bruce Sterling's essay, um, short story, um, short science fiction piece called Kiosk. Uh, and this is, of course, the, the idea of a sort of a, a future economy in which um, people, um, uh, an artisan on the street would maybe have a mobile laboratory that would allow him to go about and photocopy objects on, um, on street corners. Uh, and this is, uh, it, it, recently, this is probably about two or three months ago, The Economist um, did a, a cover issue, a cover story in, um, uh, in which it declared the advent of uh, a third industrial revolution, uh, really referencing the uh, technological upheaval, the, 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 well, the, the e upheaval in the um, industrial production that was being brought about by these technologies in which objects could really uh, be replicated on the spot uh, and questioning a lot of, I mean, obviously projects like this are really posing questions about the idea of authorship and copyright. How do you protect objects? But more importantly, should you protect project? protect objects? Should objects be, is it possible today for a designer to base the kind of their own economic model around the economic model that the designer of the 20th century uh, based his work on? Does it make sense? Is the design industry heading towards a situation similar to that of the music industry? Does it need to find completely do, uh, different models? Uh, and of, all of this in a way um, hints at the idea that the designer, as in Thomas's Open Structures project, is not somebody who can um, think of, uh, can aim to produce finished objects of perfection that the end user will passi passively take on and use in which the designer uh, intended. Uh, and of course, if you think about the great design icons of the 21st century, uh, the little that has been of it so far, uh, probably a lot of people would point instantaneously to the iPhone. Uh, and probably thinking of its incredibly beautiful glass finish and the metal band around it and the incredibly high, sophisticated technology that underlies this, um, this piece of design. But in fact, what is truly rev revolutionary about the iPhone is not so much the object itself, but the fact that the designers conceived a platform that could be put to all sorts of uses that they could never have even dreamed of when they made it. This is actually not a telephone, uh, it's a GSM capable uh, platform that is also a processor, that also has a camera on board, that also has an accelerometer, that also has a magnetometer, uh, and all of these things together can be harnessed, some of them, all of them, um, as many as you uh, need. Uh, and this is an incredibly um, interesting project that in a way sums up this idea of the iPhone as something that is a kind of a meta object that's in a way a system, a platform. Uh, two Canadian teenagers uh, strapped an iPhone onto a helium weather balloon, these, these balloons that are sent up into the atmosphere to um, 
measure uh, atmospheric conditions. Uh, they strapped a, uh, an iPhone onto the bottom uh, and they stuck this little Lego man in front uh, and they switched on the um, filming the camera and they switched on the GPS and they just sent it up to space. I mean, obviously it was quite some work behind this. They didn't just do it in five minutes. It was months of research, found the right day. And they uh, filmed the whole of the ascent of this Lego man into space uh, until the balloon popped at a height that they had predetermined. And then they filmed it falling back down to Earth. And as soon as it hit the Earth, it started transmitting its GPS signal so that they could actually go and pick it up. They put the, um, put the video online and uh, Six months later, they had an invite to TED, and they've become like a global stars uh, for this sort of ad hoc space mission that they put together themselves with a total budget of something like $1,000. Uh, and, the, and, and they literally got to the point where you could actually see the curvature of the Earth. Uh, and what's really incredible about this is that projects of this kind which really explore what a few years ago was the domain of NASA and of major governmental agencies have become everyday internet phenomena. People experimenting with objects, transforming them, doing things that we had never possibly um, expected. Uh, and this is Howard Rourke, if you've um, read The Fountainhead or you've seen the film um, uh, Ayn Rand's uh, Fountainhead. Uh, this is in a way the uh, exact opposite. Um, it's kind of interesting these two images are sort of um, uh, so similar in many ways, yet so completely opposite in terms of what they represent. This is the, uh, the ideal of the designer as a heroic um, almost godlike figure that is looking down on the city and imposing his own vision uh, as opposed to the the idea of a kind of a bottom-up movement which is completely unpredictable completely uh, uh, un and, and the, 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 of course the, the, the Howard Rourke model that uh, we were so used to until the day before yesterday uh, is originates um, in the the uh, you can find it as far back as the 1500s in fact you could argue that Giorgio Vasari was uh, the one who invented the, the, the Italian um, his, uh, historian of art and architecture, who was, uh, wrote this um, kind of one of the seminal books of um, art history, which was The Lives of the Artists, who for the first time actually projected authorship onto the idea of painting, sculpture, and architecture. Uh, and in the 500 years that followed, arrived um, uh, actually catapulted the designer, the, the um, uh, artist, to this figure of um, almost godlike stardom that, has, that we have come to know today. Uh, and, and then again you contrast that with certain groups that are emerging now uh, that are really starting to explore the outer limits such as Herbs, who I believe did a workshop in um, New York in this um, pavilion. Uh, things like Torre Confinanzas in um, uh, in um, uh, Caracas, which is a tower, a, a former banking tower that was actually taken over by um, a, a group of 800 families um, from the periphery and transformed into a vertical city of sorts. Or projects like this one in, uh, uh, I think it was in Brighton in the UK, where a group of um, residents collaborated with um, uh, collaborated to actually map the daily use of electricity onto the street uh, and to actually transform the street itself into a sort of a, a collaborative graph of their electricity consumption uh, and in turn something that influenced profoundly the way that they actually related to consumption uh, and that uh, had a significant effect in terms of actually um, bring it down, or, or this uh, open Wi-Fi system that was set up in um, uh, Afghanistan, in Kabul. Uh, completely ad hoc, made through the most simple um, elements, self-replicable elements that could be plugged onto um, pretty much any, anywhere where there was electricity and would uh, act like um, radio station repeaters that would take Wi-Fi out throughout the city and actually turned into a major uh, network. Or one of the most interesting um, case studies is uh, Ravintala Paiva, uh, which is a festival that occurs on a regular basis in um, Helsinki. Uh, the interesting thing about this um, festival is that it's, um, so to speak, kind of completely illegal. Uh, now, the, th the thing about this um, 
have to, uh, th actually I'll take a couple of minutes just to tell the story of this. There was a, a, a 20 something year old guy who wanted to set up an ice cream van uh, in the city of Helsinki to serve food, uh, to serve ice cream, and was so frustrated by the um, by the uh, bureaucracy that he had to go through to uh, to be able to sell ice cream from a van in the city that he decided to uh, actually just simply do it. But he knew, he knew that if he did it and he, he just went out and sold ice cream from his van, in a matter of hours he would be shut down, arrested, whatever, fined, uh, and so on. So he decided to actually set up a, a group on Facebook in which uh, he would encourage everybody on the same day to go out into the street and sell food. Uh, and he, was, he, he reasoned that if enough people did it together, they couldn't arrest the whole city. Uh, it happened to be a really beautiful day. Uh, it turned into a huge success. People were um, setting up barbecues in the park, uh, selling food out of the windows of their apartments, um, really uh, kind of t taking over the streets in a way. Uh, and, it, 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 and it was all based around the single Facebook page. Uh, so in a way, it was a kind of a Scandinavian version of the Arab Spring. Um, and <laughs> with the due differences that come from being in Scandinavia. And uh, the, the result was actually an institution that completely flies under the radar of the, si of the institutional apparatus of the city, uh, but that uh, has become incredibly successful and that it actually is now repeated three times a year. Uh, and it's, a, it's this kind of a completely um, a revolution against the, all of the normative approach towards um, what selling food is. I mean, I think the genius thing about it is the way that food is a, becomes like a, a Trojan horse of sorts because food is one of the most kind of the conviviality. I mean, you can see here that, that food is kind of one of those prim, primeval uh, rituals that uh, of bringing people together. And this is something really Reverend Telapaiva really brought back uh, to the city. So this idea of um, coming together. So. And I, I think what's really most fascinating about this in a way is, first of all, that it's uh, not designed by anybody, it's not designed by bureaucrats, it's not designed by, it's, it's an individual who could simply leverage collective will to occupy space, to um, come together. Um, and the, the second thing is that it embodies something that we culturally, partly as a result of social media, partly as a result of uh, being connected to, um, permanently connected to everyone everywhere and to be able to share ideas, everyone everywhere through our smartphones, through our um, uh, internet connections, through our telephones and so on. Uh, and has actually, without even realizing it, culturally we've changed profoundly. Uh, and th uh, for that reason we've, um, Adhocracy is actually the title that we've given to this um, exhibition in Istanbul, um, the, the biennial, uh, which in a way kind of sum, sums up this uh, this revolution against bureaucracy, revolution against the kind of um, uh, the, the, the the normative top-down structured approach to how problems should be solved, and instead replace that with a sort of an ad hoc, uh, improvised, but also, and, and quite intuitive, but also incredibly powerful understanding of design's potential. Um, so I think with that, I'll, uh, I think that's, that's just kind of an overview, and I wanted to kind of put that out there as a premise, because in a way, I think you can see that many other fields of design and of urbanism even have developed a lot more um, quickly have appropriated much more quickly the logic of um, open source uh, production. What does it mean for architecture today? I think that's the big um, question. It's probably the most difficult question because architecture really embodies, uh, it's the most powerful embodiment of this uh, modernist ideal of top-down um, approach. So um, maybe, uh, uh, Carlo, we can uh, take it on to uh, the next, um, open it up.